Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Monday morning, uh, cliffcentral.com, and uh, yours truly, Leanne Moll, and Mbolelo Tinta to keep you company. What's happening? What's happening? How's the weekend? Any any war stories to share? Any uh, extraordinary experiences? Any uh, very, very exciting conversations that were had? Or not really? It was just kind of like, you know, I see Cyril uh, just, you know, because it came up last night on TV. He, he, he pitches up on TV now. He tells us stuff and we're meant to sit up and take notice, I suppose. But he was on last night, yammering mm -hmm. at scenes. And he's done... Us the enormous favor. He let us know it was an enormous favor. He and Cabinet have sat on this idea for a whole long time, he said. And we've decided, because things are going really well, we're going to go down to level two. Or adjusted. He called, it, yeah, he called it adjusted level two. I don't know what mm -hmm. the fuck. I've forgotten what any of this stuff is. Do you know? It means it, level two, but with a couple of... Um, yeah, but what's Different level two? Things. I don't even remember what that is. I, I didn't even know what level we were on. Level two is um, a better curfew. We were on three, adjusted level three. Oh. Uh, the curfew was from 10 o'clock at night, but now it's 11, which means oh. restaurants close at 10. Oh. Um, alcohol oh, yeah. consumption. Oh, he gave us a whole hour extra at night. How nice. Oh, I was so you, lucky. You were, you were able to buy alcohol from Mondays to Thursdays, but now you can yes. do it from Mondays to Fridays. Oh, what privileges <laughs> have descended from heaven down to us. Much, but many, have, many have more been people. Have level two before, Leanne? Yes, I believe oh. so, yes. Um, many more people are allowed indoors at events. Oh. Allow. Um, funerals are still restricted. And oh, years. Because that's uh, what I've really missed is a good funeral. But it means that, you know, um, venues should be filled to 50% capacity still. <clears throat> yep. um, but it does mean that you can go to a half full nightclub if you like, as long as you're out of there by 10. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, Meantime. that makes a lot of sense. Because, of course, 10 o'clock is when the nightclubs are really starting to get boring anyway. So, yeah, if you're going to go <laughs> out, that's not <laughs> It's definitely home time by then. Everyone's Very tired. <laughs> nonsense is this? Are we living in the right era? <laughs> what is this? Well, yeah. you'll, you'll find that these are practices that are, that are practiced worldwide, Gareth. Yes, by well, equally, equally stupid governments who are doing equally stupid things. And that's not true anymore. I mean, no one has to wear a mask in in England anymore. No one, no one has to wear. You don't have to walk around in a mask and sanitize your hands every two minutes, or worry about the capacity of a restaurant in Greece or in Italy right now. You don't. Well, because they're they've they've got a very high vaccination rate. And, oh, and also, most of the Brits are inbred, so they they don't really get affected by COVID because <laughs> of their history. Right. We yeah. we have um fifty percent of over sixties who are now vaccinated. Sorry, seventy percent of over sixties so, who are vaccinated. So tell me quickly, um, with all of these marvelous new privileges that Cyril's devolved down upon us peasants, uh, are we? Uh, 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 how long until we get to level zero, whatever that is, where we where we don't have any of this shit anymore? When everyone's vaccinated. Oh, is that it? Right. But I would it, by, the, by the way, in the south of America, uh, Tuscaloosa this weekend, uh, mm. the, the national football champs, uh, uh, the Alabama um, Crimson Tide, had 100,000 people swapping yeah. saliva in a stadium. Okay, and college correct. football's back. And Cristiano Ronaldo returned in England, uh -huh. 78,000 in Old Trafford. People are out here living their best lives. Right. So, and, 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 and guaranteed, uh, the, the numbers are not sky high with deaths from COVID. And I can promise you, 90% of the people in Florida are not vaccinated. And Alabama. Not, uh, forget Florida, for one. Alabama is like Jesus Town, yeah. anti-vaxxable. Right. So there are, a lot of, there are a lot of people who are vaccinated in those countries, but there are also a few people who are not. And so what? The ones who are worried have probably been vaccinated. The ones who are not worried don't care. They didn't care at the start. They don't care now. Also, the anti-vaxxers have come to a realization. I'm seeing a bit of a trend. 
Oh, have um, they? Yes. They're realizing that COVID is now targeting people who haven't been vaccinated. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, COVID's, not, COVID's doing what, what any virus would do. Exactly. Um, but they, they yeah. think that it's... It's it's um it's evil behind it that now COVID is attacking all the people who haven't for some reason all the people who haven't been vaccinated and they couldn't figure that out before. All right, well look at this. I mean Samantha's just echoing my statements here. She says honestly, I've also lost track of these levels. I'm just carrying on with life regardless. I don't care anymore. I don't. I told you that I I went home a couple of weeks ago um, after curfew because I was I was at some friends and there was no. There was nothing to stop me. I, I drove home after curfew. I don't care about Cyril's curfew at all anymore. In fact, I don't I don't care about any of his stupid rules. Not a one. They are not helping well, anybody. Might, you, They're you dumb. You not, but restaurants and public places have to comply. Otherwise, so, they'll face the wrath of the law. And And I feel that they're being unfairly targeted and harassed. There's a a friend of mine who owns a place um, in Johannesburg, and he has had the police harassing him nonstop. They come in, they count the people. Regardless, so he's not breaking any other rules, right? He's not looking for trouble. It's not some sort of den, den of iniquity. He has he has as many people in there as he can because he needs to make money. His business has been on the precipice for months. Yeah, well over yeah. a year and a half now. He's he hasn't known whether he could trade or not on a you know, weekly basis because these morons that we have in cabinet are kind of capriciously making up rules whether they like this or they like that or they feel like this or they feel like that. And he's tried to keep a business going, which let me tell you is a lot harder than running a government. And he says the cops come in there and they, they, they just basically, they, they're trying to shake him down. That's what they're doing. They're like, oh. You know, if we count more than three people in the pisser at half past nine at night, then we know you're, you're in breach and we're going to take you off to jail. That kind of thing. How do you manage that? I mean, these are, these are the very worst people to be making rules, making rules. And I feel like I feel like it's a kind of, it's like a mafia sort of situation. They make these rules so that they can, just so that you know that they can fuck with you a bit. In other words, your own freedoms are somehow sacrificed at the altar of this supposed boogeyman of COVID, which is, again, I'll point out, not killed nearly the number of people that they promised us it would. I mean, I was getting quite excited at the beginning of COVID. I was like, fuck, we're going to lose a lot of people. And it just hasn't happened. So, sorry, I'm, I'm becoming more and more callous about this. And I did say, right at the start, when I had that in interview with uh, Reedy Tlaby, who, by the way, I saw on TV yesterday, She's looking fantastic. You know, I had that interview with her and that um, that pipsqueak uh, academic socialist from the, I don't know, so, some, some tenured university job who's never really experienced the real world. And I said to them then, that was in March or April of last year, I said, this lockdown is stupid. It's going to cause more harm than protect people. And I think we can see that that is precisely what has happened anywhere in the world they've done it. It made no discernible difference in terms of the, the virus. None whatsoever. All that it's done is put thousands of businesses out of action and ruined people's lives. So here we are. Here we are again, having the same conversation almost two years later, and these morons are still making their decisions. And, and Cyril goes on TV last night like he's doing us the biggest favor. He's like, you know what? I'm going to give you some of your own stuff back. I stole it from you. I broke into your house and took three quarters of your stuff. I'm going to give you back a little, I'll give you, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the TV, but, but for the hi-fi, I'll come back and give you that if you're good. And all that food that was in your fridge, I'm taking that, I'm afraid. And by now it's expired, so I can't really replace it. That's what he's doing, <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> anyway, so yes, I had a very nice weekend. I saw lots of friends. I saw Canton on, on Saturday. It was his birthday. Mm. And uh, yeah, he had a, a lamb on the spit going with a couple of really interesting people at his uh, birthday party yesterday. Were the people I mean, on, also on the spit? Uh, well, you know what Canton's like. It's it's always it's always a little bit. Uh, there's a bit know. of argument, philosophy going on, but uh, really good food. My God, oh, I ate well this weekend. And then I went to this memorial service for that friend of mine I told you about the other day. But it was it was the most. 
un-PC, un-memorial service thing I've ever been to in my life. Like there were people dancing and drinking and so this is, I mean, it was happy, which I think she would have liked, but it was very bizarre. I mean, I did look at it and go, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> did you maybe very. arrive late and they'd already finished like the, no. the servicey bits? No, I actually went with, um, with another couple that I'm really good friends with. So we all drove in together and it was just a very different sort of thing. It wasn't what I was expecting at all. There was no... There were no speeches at all. There were no um, there were no people crying or looking sad or weeping or being miserable. They were all just kind of having a happy time with each other, which That's I think. That's what I'd like at my yeah. My, I think it's quite nice. memorial. I'd love to see what what kind of memorial would you like, Leanne? I mean, like I, I imagine definitely be a... <clears throat> definitely nothing in a church, nothing religious. Please don't no. make a fool of me while I'm not there to defend myself. Um, and I think people know me well enough now to, to know that. Um, to also not speak about me as if I'm still there because I'm dead. Um, <laughs> you know, not like she's still with us, she'll be in this flower and you'll remember her every, ever more. No, my, I cease to exist. I'm gone. Yeah, okay. all right. Um, but also, I've, I've already said I'd like um, Dexy's Midnight Runners playing. Uh, I've got a special song that I'd like played. What, come um, on, Eileen. Yes, still my favorite song. And um, just, yeah, have a party and drink as much as I would. Try and try and out-drink me, actually. Sure. It's, it's because, I mean, that, that, that might be the thing that kills you, and then you'll have people trying to kill themselves at your at your memorial because they'll be trying to compete. Oh, well, I mean, at least they can have some empathy and just, you know, try and go through what I was going through at the time. Yeah. So. Yeah. And you? Listen. Now you? No, no, I, no, I don't. I don't really care because I won't be here. So just do whatever you want. But I did say to them that I, I would like. So there are a couple of things I'd like to happen that would be funny because we were joking about this on the way to the, the the thing yesterday. I said, well, I do. I like the idea of people having a happy time and lots of fun and music and you know, and and, and drinks and just people laughing and saying to each other, you know, this is the this is the stupidest thing that I remember about Gareth. But I did say what I'd really like to happen. It's two things. First of all, hire somebody who looks very mysterious, like some girl with, you know, very very dark uh, features and 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 wearing only black and looking very glamorous and exciting with a big hat, and she must sit really close to all the action and just weep <laughs> uncontrollably. And nobody must know who she is. Uh, I'll pay for her out of my estate, right? So that she. I think you had like some secret lover. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I want. I want her to like. Make but weep like like she's the one who's hurting the most. You know, she must be a really good actress, but she must look <laughs> glamorous as hell. She must be like the most beautiful, beautiful woman, but very dark and mysterious. And then I want everyone at the uh, during the speeches, if there are any, I'd like at at a certain point in the speeches, everybody I've slept with to stand up, and everybody <laughs> I haven't slept with, to stand up. and then for them to see who else I've slept with, because I think that'll be really exciting for them. I think they'll laugh a lot. You might start a bit of a cat fight. <laughs> That's okay, because I won't be there. But if I if I am in some next life, I'll be looking down laughing my ass off. So I thought that could be funny. <laughs> anyway, look at this. Uh, Audrey says, my son graduated with hospitality diploma last year. Sadly, no jobs available in the industry. When he started, the chances of getting a job were estimated at 90%. Mm. You know, again, I see I see in the news, they've, they've decided to put up some... Um, like a, a cable thing that you can go on in in somewhere in the in the Western Cape, and it's this long thing that you hook yourself onto, and they like send you down this cable, and it's like a kilometer long. It looks really cool, but I keep thinking, you know, our whole tourism sector has been hit so damn hard by all of this. Mm. Thank God, obviously, for the local tourism market because that's kept some of it going, but there've been no international visitors. Or if there have been a bit, tiny, tiny sliver of what there used to be. And I think about all the businesses that depend on that money. You know, these wine farms and these little Airbnbs and mm. people who run, you know, little uh, getaways in the bush or whatever. I think these poor people have really had to just find innovative ways of doing things and change their whole business model. And of course, you know, that kind of hardship as, as paradoxical as it sounds, that's good for businesses in some way because it helps them to really streamline and come up with brilliant things that they didn't think of before because they didn't have to. It 
interesting and the going was easy. But oy, 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 to put them under this pressure so unnecessarily, it just it drives me crazy. And by the way, did you see Mbulelo? You're the one who always brings up Cyril's suits. Now, he was wearing this very loud shirt. Mm-hmm. Loud and, you know, on TV, they, they often tell you not to wear patterns that are too like complicated or busy because it actually looks really bad on TV. It, it does something mm. called strobing. If yeah, it's, that's if, right. Very small, and then it almost looks like it's it's flashing at you. And Cyril was wearing this incredibly uh, detailed black and white kind of shirt, but it was loud, man. It was loud, yeah. and it was, <clears throat> it was quite obnoxious. And it was all monochrome except for two little pinkish, purplish strips above the pockets, um, yeah. either over over each titty. But um, uh, <clears throat> the collar was was very seventies. It was a very, very big. Big broad collar. I thought um, he was going to get up and start going. Ah, 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 mm. ah! Still alive, still alive. Well, it would it would have been appropriate given the subject matter. Yeah, exactly. Jeez. At his size, I'd be surprised if he can get up at all. <laughs> oh my god! So look at this. Jade says London is living their best lives at the moment. We just had our week of summer. <laughs> week can't wait to go home in december and have a decent summer well jade you are welcome let's just hope that they open up travel because we are we're still on the list of bad people you know south africa like we yeah there's lots of places we can't go yet and lots of places that won't send anyone here we're still on the uh, red alert for for the uk they don't want us so so do you yeah. want to hear an incredible story by the way go on um so india who were who are playing cricket in england by the way so they've been in england it's the fifth test match, so it's like three months into the whole thing. The, yep. So the last test match got cancelled because one of the Indian staff had COVID, but England are scared that he brought a strain from India, but he's been <laughs> in England ago. for three months. <laughs> so so he's got, he only got COVID now. So It's yeah, the India virus. Yes. No. <laughs> I watched that. It's going to be... The, eventually you get to, to the end and there's the omega and then we lose the Greek alphabet and we have to go on to another alphabet. So hang on for that one. So Sun Marie says, I'm coming to your funeral, Gareth, invite or not. Well, I mean, we've slept together, so you'll have to because you're going to be one what? of the people who's coming up. <laughs> right? I think it's the right. I think that's the same Sun Marie I'm thinking of. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so uh, Uncle Potse says, lol, fourth wave is predicted in December. So yeah. Yeah, that oh. fourth wave bullshit. You watch, there There are already people like lining up all kinds of crap for like the tenth wave. You know, some of these people can't get enough of this, and most of them are politicians. Please, can we stop entrusting these people with anything? We've got these local and municipal elections, which fortunately have not been postponed. They're going to happen in November. Please put people in there who you actually know in your community, right? Because these are local and municipal. So do, do yourself a favor, actually find out who the candidates are. Like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to find out who our councillor is for this area. And I'm going to go meet them. I'm going to say to them, I want to sit down. I will take, I'll take you because you're supposedly a poor politician. I'll take you for coffee. And I want half an hour of your time and I want to ask you what you're all about. And I will only vote for you once I've actually had the answers that I want from you. Otherwise, I will vote for someone else. And I'll take all of them. I'll take out each person from each of the parties who's likely. I'm not going to take you know, 700 councillors to coffee. But... One at a time, let's say the three biggest, the three likeliest to win. And I'm going to meet them and I'm going to interview them for the job. And you can do that too. Well, <clears throat> I, I wish that I felt uplifted by that and knowing that things might change. But all the people who've been complaining about the ANC are going to vote ANC, right? You do know that. You, you don't know that. I think that there's actually quite a lot of real frustration like there hasn't been before. Seriously, I know, I know old school ANC voters who are gutful. I don't think it's true that people will just automatically give their vote to them anymore. You know, especially when, like, this is the like eighth or ninth time round now that some people are voting, and you know, after eight or nine times where your life hasn't improved one little bit, a lot of people just don't go anymore. But the ones who are going now may just give a different party a chance. I mean, it could be anybody. You know, I don't, I don't think that this is even, even about parties when you get to the municipal level, Leah, because there could be a person who in your community has just been doing incredible things. Like they've 
managed to get the, uh, the, the, the local authority to, to build people correctly, or maybe they've helped plant a garden somewhere, or maybe they've cleaned up a river or something. Those people, I think those people have a serious chance of getting into local politics and making a difference. And Pumi always says on the burning platform, she always goes, well, it's up to us. And she's right. But if there are people who are putting their hand up and saying, I'm available, and you sit down with them and you, you think that their answers are successful and sound like they might be, they might be the right candidate for something, this is how we make a change. So if you don't want to stand yourself, like I don't want to stand for, for political office, then at least meet the people who do. And then use, I know it's only one vote, but I'll tell you what, um, I talk to a, an audience here every morning of very smart people, and we learn lots of interesting things from this audience of ours, right? And if we can make a difference, just all of us, and we can start influencing things in a positive way, it doesn't take a majority of people to do these, these, these major changes. It only takes an intransigent or specific or very focused minority. That's all it takes. You don't need every person in South Africa to go out and change their vote. You just need a loud and, and determined minority, and you can make huge changes. Um, South Africa is even on the red list for Djibouti. <laughs> Been not here since Jan Jesus, Djibouti. They must have the cheek to tell us that we're on a red list, really. So Vian, you, so Vian, yeah. is Vian stuck there? Yeah, he's stuck in Djibouti. What a horrible thing to happen. Oh, good Lord. Yeah, good Lord. Absolutely. Um, uh, Jean says, anyone saw that former Springer, Springbok rugby coach, Peter de Villiers, is running as a candidate for mayor in Paul? Oh really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did see the story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know how true it is. <laughs> yeah, so do the do the voice, Bolello. You've got it. Oh really? Yeah, I get you, it. you know, it's uh, <laughs> important for the people that uh, we all get ourselves to vote to the polls. <laughs> so, so he's going to stand for mayor of Paul. Okay, good. I'm going to meet the uh, the people who are standing for mayor of of Pretoria this week. I've decided. Um, because there was an invitation I got on over the weekend, and I'm going to go to this thing. It's on Wednesday night, and I'll report back. I'll tell you what they what they say. Uh, the ANC will walk it. That's exactly with, with what with they are as complacent. Why they're as complacent as they are? It's a reflection of what South Africa's become. Yeah, but Jim, okay, so you say that. So then, what? Are you just going to sit there and throw your hands up to heaven and go, "Oh, everything's so cock"? Okay, that's fine. I mean, we can all moan. That's not making an improvement to anything. So, it's, it's so true. And you know what? I was with this. I was at a mentor's uh, house this weekend, and he was telling me something interesting that's happening more and more in his circles is that, you, uh, and I don't know if people know if this is happening, but oh. he, rich people are paying governments to stay away just to let you yeah. know. So if we don't vote, uh, people, so he lives in Sandown. I mean, I've, uh, whenever I go to his house, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's like going to a different country. And right. um, yeah, but they are paying the government to stay away. So what that tells us is that like, I loved what you were saying is we have to make the difference. Yeah. They, like, like rich people are not playing around with the ANC or DA bullshit anymore. They don't want no. anyone. I'm telling you in Sandown, if you live there and you're from that echelon, good, good for you. But they are paying yeah. people to stay away. We'll look after ourselves. We'll put up our own speed bumps. We'll put our own gates up. Get, get the hell out of here. So, you know, yeah, I think that I think there's um there's also that, that, that kind of tipping point that comes into play where people are just, they cut full. And, and that's what I was saying to Leanne about the ANC voters. A lot of people are just like, no, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to let these people mess, we, m mess with my life. And, you know, it's, it's becoming devolved instead of evolved. And that's good because the smaller and more local and less powerful your government is, the better for everybody. I just I, all I want them to do. You've said this before, Mbulelo. Just be efficient. Uh, just fix the roads. Just make sure that the electricity works at a local level. That's all we care about. I'm not interested in your ideology or, you know, what you think about the world or can you do this stuff? Have you got practical experience? Do that stuff. I don't care about the rest. And, I, don't and often, if, I don't even care if you skim off like ten percent that I don't know about. But don't skim off more than ten percent. Right, exactly. Take, take your piece. Your your politicians. We know you're cretins, but 
you know, often the South African narrative is that, oh, no, if the ANC is out of power, what about safety? Is that also voting is a skill, by the way. You don't have to vote the same local as you do national. So you must yeah. you must also, it's really important that, uh, well, I'm, I'm doing my best, obviously, and I have done to educate myself on, on, on what, how our voting system works, how voting local works, what does that affect, what can my local government do, as opposed to, why do we need the ANC in power? I mean, we, you can get into the long grass at that level. So sure. it's important to kind of realize these things. You know, it's it's a very idiosyncratic system. Hey, and listen, I, I understand there are going to be people who listen to us now going, oh, these stupid idiots, don't they get it? You know, honestly, I just, yes, I, I think we've got it. You've got to hold out some hope. Otherwise, what the hell have you got in life? And it's not so bad. Like you, there are really worse places on planet Earth than, you know, Johannesburg or Cape Town or, Durban or Bloemfontein, there are many worse places than those. So take the good, write a list of all the things that you like about being you and living your life, and then write a list of things that you don't like and start fixing the ones on the on the right. Honestly, it's not that hard. Uh, Robin says, Gareth, I called out a building site on Saturday. Um, oh, this is interesting. I told them that it sounded like Armageddon at 7 a.m. Lol. Well, that's a horrible thing to wake up to. I told you I woke up last Saturday to my neighbors across the road from me. It, it sounded like <laughs> the leaf they were, blower. No, no, it wasn't even. It was the leaf blower. There was a, there was a weed eater. There was a lawnmower. There was a hammering. There, it sounded like, honestly, like a team of people had descended on this house. And I think it was. It was like some gardening service or something. But Jesus, 6.30 in the morning on a Saturday. Yo. But people don't care, hey? Like, like yesterday, um, so I, I went for a run, came home. And the neighbor upstairs, as though the nightmare I've got going next door just took a whole nother level this weekend. But Oh, oh no, whatever. sorry. Are, they, are those children still there? Well, the children are still there, but now it's like the, the, they're using power tools to sand their table on a Sunday. Like, no, 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 there's rules for this. But anyway, I went and addressed that. But like the neighbor upstairs just has a like gospel music blaring. So I, now I've got to go up there and go, no, 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 we, we're not – Sorry, like we're not in the hood. No, not here. Yeah. No, no, you don't do that. Not here. We, we, I was we don't quite, do that. I'm quite proud of, of my neighbor on the other side. Uh, he had a big party on Saturday. He had a food truck parked outside his house. He had music playing, live music, Nochal. And mm. I said to him, I just sent him a message and said, I'm really happy that I'm not the only one in this neighborhood who has people around and does like, fun things thank god for you because i really thought like most of my neighbors were either already dead in their houses of covid or fast asleep most of the time were you so trying to crack an invite no not at all i said to him just um <laughs> you know, let me let me know if uh if you need to if if i'm making a noise or if i'm interrupting your party in any way um i just thought he he puts up with so many of, of my uh, noisy friends so often i thought i just want him to know that it's i'm totally cool with him having a party every now and then because I really am. I like that. I like the fact that it's it's not all boring here in the neighborhood. Mm. Anyway, so a um, couple of things we need to get to. How about some headlines? Because it is half past. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see what's happening in the world. And it's not just all about it. Um, okay, first of all, a Venice Film Festival abortion drama wins top prize. Can I just say that I, I really don't have... Uh, a big dog in this fight uh, when it comes to abortion. I find, though, that there are lots and lots of people who are so emotional about this thing. And, and perhaps it's obvious to some of us why they would be emotional, because you're dealing with either the innocent life of an unborn child or you're dealing with a woman's right to choose what happens with her body. And both of those are obviously quite serious and emotive subjects. What I don't understand is people who celebrate abortion. To me, there's something really macabre about that. Something, something a little bit upsetting about people who, and remember, I don't, I don't have children. I've, thank God, not made anyone pregnant and had to, uh, you know, have the discussion about abortion or anything else. So I'm, I can speak about this with some dispassion. Um, you know, it's not a, it's not a thing that's involved me yet, and I hope it never will. Um, there is, there is a, a, a cater of people in the world who seem to be like, you know, you get these like Hollywood, very left-wing, blue and pink hair kind of women who say, <clears throat> I love abortion. 
and like they're proud of their abortions. They they talk about it like it's a like it's a war decoration, you know. I think that's not that's not really the thing that you should be proud of. And there are a lot of them who make these statements about how having an abortion was the best thing they ever did. And that that makes me very uncomfortable. I don't think I'm the only one. Mm. You know what I mean? It's a a very, you know, many times abortion is um, coupled with an unpleasant experience. You need to think about those times too. Sure. Um, It should be, it should be quite a somber moment. It's not like, it shouldn't be treated flippantly. I'm certainly pro-choice, and I would much rather um, one person deal with the, the trauma of an abortion, which which it is um, and can be, than that person having a traumatic rest of their life raising a child that they're either battling to raise or that reminds them of their bad experience. Yeah, um, I get but that. I, but I think it should be it should be treated. You know, somebody certainly not anything yeah, to you see celebrate. These, you do get these um, these these extremely uh, insensitive people who like they're proud of it. They're actually they're out there saying that having an abortion is the best thing that ever happened to them. I'm like, surely that's not something you want people to think of when they think of you. If it's, anything, oh, that's, celebrates. That's the chick who had the abortion. You know, you know, it's just not. I don't know. I, no. Again, it's not, not my not my monkey, not my circus. If it, if there's anything to celebrate, it's it's being able to choose, you know, make your own decisions. That's something to celebrate. Sure, I I, I totally agree with that. You, you you know, especially in in awful cases, women get raped or or whatever sure. kind of situation. We want that to to you know, of course, choice. the number of of uh, abortions is a, that are a result of of rape or incest, God forbid, or you know, some kind of of, of real. Um, deformity or issue with the child is a tiny sliver. I mean, most of it is mm. actually just, I, I think for a lot of people, abortion has become a kind of birth control, you know, a, a sort of irresponsible after the fact kind of birth control. And I, I think that that's also not necessarily just morally. I, it's, a, it's a fairly indefensible position. That's all I'm going to mm. say. As a woman, I'm not going to interfere in your right to choose. It's none of my business, but I think it's fairly morally indefensible to just use abortion as a kind of birth control. I think in those other situations that you mentioned in Bulelo, those are those are obviously morally a lot more complicated. Yeah. But simply as a birth control back back door, you know, I don't I don't like that. I think that that's just a that's like that's like saying, well, you know, you 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 didn't look after your house and you you never tidied it up, and now it's collapsing on you. So set the thing on fire, and then claim the insurance. You know what uh-uh. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I do know what you mean, but listen, Western uh, uh, liberalism comes with a sharp side, right? The, the absolute uh, permissiveness of do do what you will is yeah, it's correct. we're hedonistic by by our very nature, and nobody likes responsibility anymore. Well, anyway, this uh, this this came about. This whole story, this whole discussion now came about because a film about illegal abortions in the 1960s in France has won the top prize at the Venice Film Festival. Audrey Diwan's Happening, uh, Les Ovomont is about a woman seeking a termination to continue studying. I did this movie with anger, with desire, with my belly, with my guts and my heart and my head, she said as she accepted the award. The film comes after controversial new, controversial new laws banning abortion after six weeks were introduced in Texas. The 78th edition of the world's oldest film festival wrapped up on Saturday night with international celebrities flocking to Venice's red carpet. Very exciting. International celebrities. We need Just on that up. note, there are... There is um, quite a big movement in um, a lot of um, East and West Coast American um, states, like California, for instance, um, Mm -hmm. where a sisterhood, I'm not entirely happy with that word, but a sisterhood has been created to support women in Texas who might need an abortion this weekend. You know, they're saying, come to California for a holiday. Um, I'll give you accommodation. I'll I'll take you to see your aunt or your cousin, in inverted commas, um, and uh, I'll, I'll be with you through the process. So I, I think what's come out of this is that it's interesting to see how many women 
are helping people in Texas who may have an issue or an unwanted pregnancy and can't do anything about it. Because remember, you only realize you're pregnant six weeks or later afterwards. Well, I think you, most of us know when we've had sex, though. So, you know. And yeah, wanted... you have no idea that you're pregnant until six well, weeks. No one's banning the morning after pill. No one's banning contraception of other kinds. You know what I mean? It's just yeah, yeah but the thing is, you can use you can use now some other woman in another state has to help you get across state lines to have an illegal abortion. I, it's just very strange to me. I'm sorry. No, well, whether you've used contraception or the morning after pill, you can still have an unwanted pregnancy. You know, you can still get COVID even though we wear a mask. Who knew? <laughs> and you can survive it, by the way. You can survive oh, you can. COVID. You can, actually. All yeah. right, so there's another story. Um, Herman Mashaba is on a massive mission. You know, he has, um, obviously, he's, he's got this party that he's launched and he's wearing the mm -hmm. green and black colors of uh, Action SA. Anyway, he was um, <clears throat> he was talking about Mpo Palazzi, and we had them both on the show the burning platform, what, two, three weeks ago. You can go and listen to that episode. It was really good because um, Paul Palazzi is a, is, a, is a medical doctor who's running for DA's mayoral candidacy in Johannesburg. And that's Herman's old job, right? So the, the two of them are not the best of friends. And uh, Herman is on full anti-DA attack mode at the moment because obviously his marriage with the DA didn't go so well. And uh, he brought the EFF into coalition there. And he says that the DA is arrogant and not interested in the poor. But I'm, I'm always very suspicious of anyone who claims to be interested in the poor and that the poor have told them that, you know, we'd like you to represent us. Because, first of all, I've never seen any document signed the poor um, because I'm not sure who those people are. Like, do you get together with the, the poor in a, I don't know, a crappy neighborhood somewhere and they all, they'll come over and you offer them a free T-shirt and then they say, yeah, you're our guy. Is that how it works with the poor? Because Herman, I don't, I don't know. Herman Mashaba, Herman Mashaba doesn't spend a huge amount of his time with the poor, if you don't mind my saying. I mean, he's a successful businessman, lives in a nice house. He uh, he spends time around other successful businessmen, but now suddenly he's the he's the guy for the poor. Is that what we're meant to believe? Yeah. You know what I mean? I, it's a bit yeah. weird. A little bit odd. Don't uh, tell me you speak for the poor uh, until you got that piece of paper that mandate from the poor that says the poor at the bottom, and all of them have signed it. Otherwise, just shut up about the poor, and right? And then the rich can co-sign and agree. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I represent the rich. Like, huh? who? Even rich people don't say, I'm rich. You know, and no poor no. person wants to be known as being the poor. Oh, hi. Uh, what's your name? Oh, my name is Denise. Denise, how would you describe yourself? As the poor? I'm with the poor. <laughs> exactly. I mean, uh, come on. All right. So the DA's mayoral candidate in Popalatse has slammed Action SA's candidate, Mashaba. She said during Mashaba's tenure as DA mayor, there were hardly any cabinet meetings. She also feels she she feels that he gave the EFF too much power while their other coalition partners were sidelined. Well, that's true. Uh, and I, I heard John Steenhazen of the DA saying, we're not going to make coalitions with people who don't share our values. Ah, because that was the mistake in the last one, is you thought, well, we just need the numbers, so we'll just ally ourselves with the EFF here and be anti-ANC. And that's not going to work. Hmm. You know, you can't put a, a, put a crocodile and uh, a whole lot of, 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 of Pomeranian dogs into an enclosure together and think, well, we'll get along together because we have the same mm -hmm. value. Clearly not. Ask the crocodile what it's interested in when it comes to the little dogs and ask the little dogs if they're afraid of the crocodile. Those are their values. <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. Uh, one last story in the news this morning that we're going to look at is uh, the newly released FBI memo, which has hinted at Saudi involvement with the 9-11 hijackers. Why is this news that most of the, most of the hijackers of those planes on 9-11 20 years ago we know we're Saudis. They certainly weren't from Afghanistan or Iran, right? That's what Do you remember that it was, yeah, it was Saudis? Like Osama bin Laden himself, the, the founder and leader of Al-Qaeda, was a Saudi man, a very wealthy Saudi man from a prominent Saudi family. How is this news suddenly? The Biden administration 
has declassified an FBI memo that fortified suspicions of official Saudi involvement with the hijackings of September 11, 2001, but it fell well short of proof that the victims' families are suing uh, Saudi Arabia and, and would be able to do that with this new evidence. In other words, they're all they're trying to get some money out of it, which... You know, that happens all over the world. The memo from 4 April 2016, which had been classified until now, showed links between Omar Bayoumi, at the time a student, but suspected to have been a Saudi intelligence operative, and two of the Al-Qaeda operatives who took pl- part in the plot to hijack and crash four airliners into targets in New York and Washington. So based on the 2009 and two- 2015 interviews with a source, whose identity is classified, the document details contacts and meetings between Bayoumi and the two hijackers. And their surnames were Al Hazmi and Al Midha after the two arrived in Southern California in 2000 ahead of the attacks. So there was also some interest- Al Hazbin, but nobody talks about him anymore. Uh, nobody talks about him. He's, he's, de- <laughs> he's not involved anymore. Mm-mm. All right. Well, we've got lots of other stuff to get to this morning. Um, but those are the main stories in the news this morning. We've also got Dr. Hanan Bushkin. Joining us in just a moment or two, it's going to be okay. That's our theme for a Monday. Let's just uh, say hi to Simpiwe, who's busy in the studio there. Hello, Simpiwe. How are you? Ah. There she uh, is. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> well, hard work this Monday morning, hey? You start early. Yes, 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 I do. Um, mm-hmm. But that's what I signed up for. Kicking ass and taking numbers. Um, I try, you know, and I try to do it as classy as possible with a smile on my yeah. face. Good. There we go. CPUM <laughs> Tetwa is taking over in the studio there. Very good. All right. Let's turn our attention to Dr. Hanan for this morning because uh, I don't want to waste a single second of his time. And uh, I was talking to two friends of mine over the weekend who love listening to you on a Monday. It's the, it's the only by appointment listening that they do because they say the rest of the time they'll just listen when it suits them. But this they like to hear live. Um, so... There are two uh, Gareth Cliff Show team members who have a bit of a clash at the moment. That's why I brought Simpiwe on briefly. They keep arguing in the office. So this is something, uh, Hanan, that I think a lot of people have to deal with in offices all over the country and all over the world. Um, It's not like they have a major personality clash, but they certainly argue about a lot of things. I mean, I've heard them, these two. And I'm interested in how you resolve these things conflict resolution is what we we said we wanted from people last last week so let's just start off with cpu and uh Mbulelo. so Mbulelo says some is always late for work even though she gets there five minutes before the show starts he believes she should be there half an hour before now these are just that's just one of the arguments that they have so would you mediate between these two and just try and figure out what the hell's going on here because it's easier to get you to do it than have have an hr situation at Cliff Central. So, Dr. Hanan, <laughs> do your thing with these. All right. All right. It will be my, my honor and privilege to get uh, to the bottom of this one. <laughs> so, maybe, uh, maybe let's start with a little bit of, uh, of more context. So, Simpiwe, can I start with you? What is the, what's the issue? What's the problem? Now, present your case. We don't have a lot of time. So, present, get to the point, and allow me to make a decision for you. All right. So the issue at hand is that Bulelo thinks I arrive late when I arrive five minutes before six o'clock. So I arrive here at five to six just before the show starts. And according to him, people should be arriving 30 minutes before or an hour before for work. It shows that I could for him, according to him, um, it means I can trust you um, with like a particular big deal one day and that you you have all your things sorted out. And for me, I'm like, no, I get to work on time and I make sure things are done and it's all about output. If I have a deadline for six o'clock or nine o'clock and it gets done, it doesn't matter what time I arrive, honestly. It should not concern you. But we clash on that and he just thinks that I don't have or yeah, I don't have good time management skills because I don't get to work 30 minutes before. Okay, so before we get to Mbulelo Simpiwa, why why do you care? Well, we work together, um, and I think it's it's really good to, to kind of... Mbulelo and I don't see eye to eye on a lot of things, but I think it's good to just have like a sense of, okay, you're here, I respect you, you respect me, and let's share our opinions. But the fact that he thinks I arrived late for work, I'm just touched. I'm just like, no, Sway. <laughs> no, 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 no. 
Simperia, how long have you known Umbelero for? Oh, nine months. Yeah, it's been, I think, nine months. Yes. Nine months. And what do you think of he, him as a person? He's the opposite of me. So I would say that I'm hot, he's cold. You know, I'm kind-hearted, he's cold-hearted. That's how I describe him. Like, we are polar opposites. And I'm always intrigued by some of the things that he says and does. And I'm like, oh, who hurt you? Like, who hurt you? Who did that to you? Because that's just not how to live life. And do you think by any chance, do you think he has a point, any point? Does he have a 1% point? Does he have a 2% good reasoning, 5% or zero? Well, with the time thing, I don't get it. Especially with us having to be, you know, here at 6 o'clock. I'm like, no, I'm here on time. And I just feel like, you know, people arriving five minutes before an agreed time is being on time and you can't tell someone is late if they arrived five minutes before like no sway that's that's ridiculous i think that's ridiculous so what do you think the resolution should be from your side that's a good question shucks <laughs> what do you um, think you should do <laughs> um if it was I up to know. you if it was up completely up to you I, you I would, would choose i would stick to still coming to work at five to six I, I don't see myself coming in any earlier unless I have to. Um, but at the same time, it's just like, I, I, I think I'm, I'm also one of those people who's like, I like being seen as a professional. So don't look at me and be like, yeah, you always late. Like, I, I think that's the issue at hand. It's like, you're looking at me and you're like, yeah, but you're always late. When I'm like, nah, I swear, I got this. Okay. So if I understand it correctly, you would want to come to work five minutes before as you do do your job, do it well, and you want Mbelelo to not judge you or your professionalism because you're five minutes early, actually. Yes, because he deems that as late. And okay, so you want that him... says a lot about me and whatnot. Like, that's, yeah. So you want him to judge you by the work output, not by the fact that oh, you're arriving to work half an hour early or five minutes early. Judge me by, my, by the outcome not by my time that I arrive at work. Correct. Like, if he was judging me on the standard of work, then I'd be like, I get where you're coming from. Time? No. I, no, no, no way. So what about okay. um, Bolero's side of this? He's been sitting there, but he's chomping at the bit. I don't <laughs> I don't have, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just putting a muzzle there. I know he's eager. He's waiting to come out. He's been preparing for this argument the whole week. So, Mbulela, go. Uh, I just, this time thing for me is, and I was trying to explain to some people, is for me, if you are late, you are showing me that you don't respect me. So, like, I, and I said to some people, I'm glad you don't work for me. Like, luckily, you don't work for me because the argument of I'm five minutes early is I never want to hear. And I, I want to tell you right now, people that always say, I'm sorry, traffic. I don't want to hear it because you should uh, you, don't, don't be shocked that there's traffic. Like, I, I, it's so disrespectful. And when you can't respect yourself, right, it means you can never respect me. You can never respect me. I don't care what you say. We are the things we do, not the things we say. So if you always leave things to the last minute, it shows me that you're willing to be disrespectful. That's that's what I see when I see people that are five minutes early um, because you can never be prepared for work, actually. Getting prepared to perform at a high level, you need to get to work, sit down, have your coffee, and be ready to go. There, there's no way you can arrive five minutes before. So to me, and my father raised me, to it's so disrespectful to not be ready to go on time. So I don't know any other way. And, and it's highly she, offensive to me, by the way. Umbulela, has she ever been late? Has she ever been late before? Yes. Uh, no, no, to me, on time is late. So, so no, no, I don't know no, if like, you're asking me. Yeah, so I'm, I'm asking specifically in a contract, it says she should be at work at six, right? Yeah. Has, she ever came, has she ever pitched up at work after six? Yes. Inevitably. Inevitably, if you're going to leave it like that, inevitably it's going oh. to happen. You get a burst tire. You the gate doesn't work. Uh, inevitably, those are things that like life happens in Bulelo. It's not like this is my character where I'm like, oh yeah, I'm five minutes late for the show. No, I'm on time for work. I don't understand why you see that as me not. Like I don't understand. I'm. I don't understand. So so so. I want to ask you. I want to ask you. I want to ask you. Simply, have you been late to work? 
after arriving after sex yes but it's yeah. it's not like a i've done it like multiple times it's been where like maybe my alarm didn't go off and i've actually had a burst tire when i was actually a like driving to work and I couldn't make it on time and I've let and I've communicated with the team to say hey guys this is what's happening and like you know I've made sure that things are in place so that you know the show continues and so it's not a everyday thing or every week thing like 95 percent of the time I'm at the office before six o'clock yeah I suspect there is a difference in personal standard here between the two of them and and that they that they have non overlapping areas of of what they consider to be their own responsibilities. Like in Bolelo is projecting what he thinks is appropriate for him onto Simpiwe and, and she's kind of confused as to why she should have to comply with Bolelo's internal regulations. So Umbulelo, based on that, what what made you? What makes you feel that the thirty minutes arriving before work is appropriate? Why not an hour? Why shouldn't she arrive there at three a.m. just to make sure that there's no traffic? So for for me, it's just about um, again. She, she's referred there to life happens. The reason you should be you should give yourself an hour is because life happens. So you shouldn't tell me life happens. I don't want to hear about that. I know life happens. That's why I give myself an hour. So. Um, to me, I, I just, I guess I, it is an internal thing for me because it, what, it, what it is for me is it's a good insight into the rest of you is immediately if you can't keep time, I just see chaos. I, I know what the rest of the, of the prism looks like. If I look a little bit deeper then you can't keep time, I know what the rest looks like. And then that scares me. Like I have to work with you. Like someday I may need you somewhere on time. Like, I, I, I really, it's a, it, it's a deeply frightening thing for me to be around those types so, of people. So, Mbulelo, let me ask you this. Are you able to change your judgment or perspective of the definition of, let's call it appropriateness or good work ethics? Are you able to compromise on that? In other words, if she arrived five minutes or 10 minutes before six o'clock, would you be able to judge that as it's still very appropriate and professional as long as the work is done? Are you able to do that? No, because I, I, I hate outcomes-based thinking. It, it, I, I'm process-based. So for me, I never want to hear that one day of, oh, sorry, my alarm. Oh, sorry. my. I don't want to hear it. I'm all about get the process right. The outcome will take care of itself. And again, it's a respect thing. If, you, if you're outcomes-based and now I need to know uh, that, oh, if, you, if there's bad weather, this person hasn't given themselves the room to perform the same, I, I get anxious around those sorts of people. So absolutely not. Absolutely okay. not. Okay. I've got a solution. Are you ready for this? Mm. Okay. Simpiwe, this is what you have to do. You have two choices. Number one, uh, arrive earlier. That's option one. Arrive earlier. And the cost of that is that you might have to change your routine. You might have to change your habits. You might have to change your sleeping habits and your uh, whatever it is that you were going to do during that morning. Uh, the cost of that is, again, you might have to change some things around, but you'll arrive early. And the benefit is that you'll have Umbalelo's professional respect. So the cost is the morning routine might have to change and the, co and the benefit is Umbalelo might see you might, 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 might. And I say might because it might not change anything, but he might see you as the professional that you want to be seen. Option two, arrive five minutes before, so don't change your habits, and the benefit is then you don't have to change much routine, but the cost is Mbulela doesn't respect you on that professional level, but then my advice to you is really don't care. He's not the one that's judging you, or he's not the one that has really any consequential impact in your life. He's not the one that's paying your salary, and you just have to be and have an amicable relationship as a friend but as a professional, you might have to agree to disagree. And that's up to you. You choose. But you can't have both. You can't arrive five minutes before and still expect him to respect you as a professional. I'm curious okay. before, before Simpiwe, because it's her decision, but I'm, I'm interested in psychologically why it became Simpiwe's decision. And, and I think it has something to do with that question you asked in Bulelo about how, how willing he is to... Exactly. Adapt, right? And you, you identified like he's the concrete wall and Simpiwe must make a decision about that concrete wall. Is that what you did? Like just from exactly a right. Exactly right. 
Exactly right, Gareth. So I asked Umbelelo how um, how negotiable are you in terms of seeing her as a professional still arriving five minutes before work? And he says, that ain't happening. So I turned to I turned to Simpiwe and I said, Simpiwe, that's okay. That's okay. So you get the choice. Well done. You're the one that gets to choose. You have the power. So you choose either to come minutes, come five minutes early <laughs> and then not care about his professional opinion of you or come in earlier and potentially have him respect you as a professional. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. I love this. We've actually done <laughs> This is live My mind is blown. <laughs> My mind is blown. You see, this is where I love uh, because we've we've spoken quite a lot uh, about the theory and kind of what goes on and what people are thinking and all the rest of it. But here you see uh, Dr. Hanan actually doing conflict resolution on the trot. So we want to have, if you have a similar situation at work, or even in your professional, uh, your personal relationships rather, and you want to tell us about that, and we can do exactly what we've just done now. You can see it's not a threatening, horrible, uh, nasty intervention that's going to embarrass anybody. We're genuinely going to try and find solutions. And we'll unpack whatever issue it is that you have with an arbitrator. You know, you've got Dr. Hananda. He's not, he hasn't got a dog in the fight, so he'll be as objective as it's possible to be. He wants you to solve problems, not develop more problems. If you like this, email us, contact at cliffcentral.com. I'm not joking. Con contact at cliffcentral.com. Let us know what your issue is. Find the other person. See if they'd be willing to do this. And let's sort sort the problem out for you. Dr. Hanan is going to charge a fortune for an, a, a normal intervention in the real world. He's going to do it here for you for free. So come on. Join us. You want to say something? Yeah, I'm still charging them for sure. <laughs> 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 All right, I love it. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Kanan. Uh, it is nice definitely to get moving with this one, but uh, Simpiwa, you've got a choice to make, and you'll let us know which decision you've made. Yeah, I'll see what time I get to work tomorrow. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll know and tomorrow how much morning. you care about it. Yeah. Correct. All right, everybody, uh, we will be back in a moment or two with the rest of the Gareth Cliff Show for this Monday morning. Don't you go anywhere. Do you suffer from collectivism? I've got this love affair with French antiques. Do you have an obsession with objects? This is a King's African Rifles bayonet. Are you a fanatic? A devotee? Are you someone exhibiting enthusiasm or strong passion? I've got like four or five really big trunks in the garage that are full of my Christmas decoration collection. Cliff Central dispenses a weekly dose of collectomania. Join me as I talk to compulsive collectors. Fascinating. Then you get the limited editions that were like a hundred made worldwide. Possibly a little weird. So I have a collection of collections. Collectomania, Mondays on the Gareth Cliff Show. Brought to you by SA Gold Coin Exchange and The Scoin Shop.
Yo, I put it like wow. This that sound. These oaks don't work hard like me. I hope they know by now. Dot com Monday morning, and uh, we are live, and we're here to look after you and keep you company, take you through your day. This Monday, Monday's always a little bit of a bumpy one because people don't exactly love coming down from the weekend and having to go straight to work and do impressive and useful and productive things. So if you're feeling like that this morning, we don't blame you. We understand. We, we get it. Um, so that was fun with Dr. Hanan. I'm really, I'm keen to get real people on here with real problems and have him solve them. I mean, it's, it's just to see actual therapy in action and to have a result is a is a terrific thing. Mm. Makes me very happy. Like I, I simply has got a choice to make now, and you know you you've decided this is where you're going, and and now you two can figure out one of those things that otherwise would be an issue. And frankly, I know that you and Simpi are not big problem people, but the reality is there are so many people who can't actually deal with any of this at work, and eventually it starts to it like it's like an acid. It starts to corrode. Their working life, they start to become obsessed with it. Um, the, the, the problem becomes much, much bigger because it hasn't been dealt with. And the two people involved, or sometimes it's more than two people involved, eventually I can't work there anymore. Like it becomes that toxic for them. So if we can help solve these problems, I tell you now, you, you're not going to get an appointment with Dr. Hanan in his private practice. He's busy 24-7. He does not have time. So the fact that we've got him here on a you know, Monday morning for a good like 20 minutes is just, that's pure gold. Make use of it. Contact at cliffcentral.com. It's a really good idea. All right. So um, we've been asking for emails from people about living in other countries and what it's like living there because we got, you know, we've interviewed a few interesting people, South Africans who've moved to other places, uh, people who've moved to South Africa from other places. And I got this from Stefano. He says, I left South Africa in 2001. I never really felt homesick. There was too much to see and experience in the world. Recently, though, I felt a need to reconnect with the country of my birth. South Africa has changed loads since I left, both in my view, positively and negatively. In fact, I think it's changed so much over these 20 years I've been away. It's not even the same place I grew up in. Nevertheless, I've realized it's still a big part of who I am, and Cliff Central is a great way to rekindle the connection to my country. I discovered Cliff Central by chance a year ago. Now I listen to the show most days, although I don't always agree with you guys. I find myself looking forward to listening. The MKT show is also top draw. That's nice. Um, compliment for you there, Bolero. And mainly because of the banter and the chirps in between, rather than the actual sports content. That's with respect to your show, Bolero. Uh, after about 10 years in London, and everyone, uh, Stefano says, should experience living there if possible, I moved to Italy, where my family is originally from. Milan is a great place because it's small but feels like a big international place. Italy offers all the obvious attractions that everyone knows. Great weather, awesome food, magical countryside, historical medieval cities, fashion, art, etc. But what I find particularly incredible is the amount of diversity in such a small country. The regions are all so different, with different cultures, dialects, and customs, from the Alps in the north to the beaches on the islands in the south. Not everything is positive, of course. Italians are usually pretty mainstream, especially with food, clothes, and entertainment. So anything out of the ordinary is often frowned upon. That can make living here one-dimensional and boring sometimes. I mean, just to, to, to break from Stefano's email for a second, honestly, living in like northern Italy, I think would be paradise. Like If I didn't live in South Africa, that would be in my top three places that I'd want to live in. So it's I love li listening to this email. This is this is really interesting stuff. Makes me think. He says, um, besides that, it's a good lifestyle. And I believe the average standard of living here is higher than in other European countries. You guys mentioned on the show that the safety and security issues in South Africa should not be reason to leave. I don't think it was the reason I initially left. I was young and I wanted to see the world. But now I can't help but think that my daughter is safer here than in South Africa. And that helps me sleep better at night. So... Just a really good piece of interesting feedback from someone who's living in Italy, near Milan. I mean, that's amazing. Thank you, Stefano. I like the uh, I like the email. Thank you for sending it to us. Isn't that cool? Very cool. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, um, his name eludes me, but the guy who we spoke to who moved from Durban to New Zealand, yes. his story is stuck in my head. Um, and it's, it's the, the, I like these stories because it's pure honesty. And yep. if the decision is a regret, um, you know, these people are admitting it, which is that for me is the hugest sign of bravery. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and and you know what? Like you you also you can you can make the decision, but then you've got to make the best of what your decision is. So if your decision mm. is I'm going to oh. move some, then make the best mm. of it, right? If you if you're gonna stay in South Africa or if you're gonna stay in whatever country you're in right now, because this is all geography, really. If your mental attitude to whatever is bad, then there's no place on earth that's gonna make you happy. If your attitude awesome. is good, awesome. you'll make it work wherever you are. You'd be in Uzbekistan and you'll make it work, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are people, there, there, there are people who want to live in Afghanistan. You know? True. Just mm -hmm. think about that. By the way, um, Bulelo, I just want to throw this in here because we've got a lot of comments on people weighing in on the Simpiwe and Bulelo being late, being early arguments. Mm -hmm. So first of all, here's uh, Sanele, who says, I agree with him, Bulelo. If someone is late factually, um, if work starts at 6, uh, you're not late if you get to work before 5.59 and 59 seconds. That's the fact. Anyone who sees anything else is seeing their own personal view. So I'm not sure. I'm actually not sure whether Sanela's on your side or on Simpiwe's side on that one. Um, it's not very clear. Michael says, people who arrive just before create added unnecessary stress for others. It's quite selfish. I don't, I don't know about that. Like I kind of, I was on Simpiwe's side for most of that discussion for what it's worth. Really. I mean, also I've been doing, I've been doing these morning shows for what, God, it feels like forever, 12 to 15 years now. And it's horrible. Like this, I don't want to cut, I don't want to sit around. I, I want to be ready to go at six. And of course I've sometimes been late. You can, that's going to happen. But I, to sit there and, and get ready for half an hour, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, to me, it's it's um, making the compromise to shave off extra sleep is on a daily basis. Um, it's almost like paying an insurance. It's a it 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 eventually adds up to something, but to what to what cost? You've actually shaved off every single day working day, some time of your sleep or your routine. Well, you, you um, know, Lelo's um, argument will be to just go to sleep earlier. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but again, the Leanne, what Leanne and Simpiwa would have probably said the same thing, is that that kind of mentality is what scares me, is always, what about my sleep? Sleep earlier. What are you talking about? Yeah. You should be disciplined enough to sleep. Oh. What do you think of this, Simbulelo? Uh, Kevin says, I've worked with so many people who are pedantic about following the process, like you are. The majority of them had low quality output with regard to KPIs. I had to micromanage them to increase output quality. You're not interested in outcome. You're interested in process. I'm I'm kind of more an outcomes guy, hey? Uh, I mean, life is all about probabilities, right? Nothing is perfect. Nobody is perfect. But if you're outcomes based, you've got to be bloody talented. You better be bloody talented. Processes ensure that you're going to get higher quality outcome more often than not, not always, not always. Life is a probability game. Good processes, more often than not, give you high, high quality output. Not always, not always, but. Well, let me tell you, what, when it comes to high quality, collectomania is my favorite thing. And you know, we're going to be doing that later this morning. And this morning, we're going to speak to somebody called Gwendolyn, who has a collection of My Little Ponies. Ooh. <laughs> wow. This is going to be interesting. All right, so hang around for that one. I think that's going to be fantastic. Can't wait. That yeah. is cool. Um, the only reason the MKT show is good is because Mbolelo uh, arrives an hour before the show starts. Well, actually, he's, <laughs> he's there three hours before the show starts. But yes, that's part of it. Um, and then, you know, there, there are a lot of people who, who, to some people, like time management is not a big deal because as long as they get it done, they don't really... I mean, I know, I know, and maybe in Bolello, you've made a good point about like really talented people and really brilliant people who can break the rules sometimes. 
Um, and they are rare, but when they deliver, they deliver in bucket loads, right? Um, and, and to them, like if you put processes around me, I like things that I'm not responsible for to run on processes. I like that a lot. I can see the wheels turning with me not having to be in, in place, right? But to, to impose that stuff on me has the opposite effect of making me productive. Like if you impose too many processes on me and I feel like I'm being hemmed in by them, I just become an automaton and I deliver the absolute minimum. That was kind of how I felt about my TV show that I just did with, with ENCA that we finished in July. I, I felt like I was being plugged into a bunch of processes and there was no room for it to be creative or interesting for me or for the audience. And I just, I, I could not wait for it to, my favorite part of the week was after that show was in the can and I didn't have to think about it for a few days. Hmm. Know what I mean? Yeah. Sure. That's, so it's different, mm -hmm. different strokes, dude. It's really, it's just incredible. What I, I loved about the conversation with you and Simpiwe this morning is that Dr. Hanan saw a way to get to a resolution. He saw a way that like, here's how we're going to fix this. Because you weren't going to move. You weren't going to budge. And, and I kind of respect that. So, so the choice is then Simpi West. It's great. He's, this is why he's so good at what he does, you know. Anyway, uh, we've got lots of other things to talk about. Don't forget Collectomania later on. It's going to be amazing. And we're going to play out an interview this week, which I've been kind of, uh, you know, I've been a little bit, mm, uh, what's the word? A cryptic about who it is, but I can now tell you. The first lady of South Africa is a woman called Dr. Tsepo Motsep. Okay, she's it comes from a really interesting family. Her younger brother is Patrice Motsepe. Her one sister is Bridget Khadebe, who married uh, Jeff Khadebe. Um, her husband is Cyril Ramaphosa. Right, she's an incredibly dignified and charming woman who does not like the limelight. In fact, I don't know if you've ever seen an interview with her. I mm. may have just done the first one ever. And the reason I have a relationship with uh, Dr. Mutsep is because my business partner, Rina, and she have been on the advisory board of a, a really incredible organization. They used to be called the Asher Trust. They're now called Early, early Development. The Early... Oh, God. I always get this wrong. Um, early Childhood Development uh, or something. ECD. I, I I can't even remember what the right uh, acronym is. But no, these guys, do, they, they, they do incredible, incredible work with young kids in townships, young kids who haven't got babysitters, who are often left in the streets of wherever they live to fend for themselves. And they don't get the basic learning skills that you need to put into people's heads while they're still very young. And Dr. Mutsepe has been heading this foundation. She's been the chairperson and the patron for the longest time. And they do such good work. And I got involved. I went to Bram Fisherville for the opening of one of these. I don't know. It must have been 12, maybe even 13 years ago. And that was the first time I met her. And I've always been hugely impressed by the people that she works with there who, who do the actual heavy lifting. So they train women to become uh, teachers, basic teachers and carers for these young kids. They provide them with a meal so that they don't go hungry through the day. And let me tell you, this woman does unbelievable things. And for the first time, she sat down and talked to us about the work that she does. And for the first time, as, as far as I can tell, she's given an interview. So I was very, very privileged to have that opportunity to talk to her. And you can get to hear it. That's amazing. Um, so we'll be, yeah, we'll be launching that this week. So I'm excited to let you in on that one. Looking cool. forward to it. All right. So now... Uh, on to Leanne's little agenda for this morning. She's got a couple of things. Apparently, this is the most bizarre story in the world. Investigations are underway because they found an overloaded truck on the N2 with 106 human corpses on it. What? Yeah, yes. Well, you're pretty mad. You right. Listen to this story. This is unbelievable. So there was a routine stop along the N2 near Somerset West. Mm -hmm. And uh, so traffic authorities pulled across this vehicle, this truck, and they found that um, it was overloaded, which, you know, prompted them to investigate a little further. Right. When they opened the back of the truck, they found at least 106 corpses 
in the back oh of this truck. Oh, wow. Um, from the image, I can see it looks as if they're in either cardboard, um, sort of pine coffins or cardboard boxes. Must be pine. Oh, wow. Okay. <clears throat> um, so basically, it, it's, it's understood that this truck was en route to the Eastern Cape. Um, the provincial health department has since said we need to know if these deaths were COVID-19 related. Could it be that perhaps? Um, the uh, necessary pa pa paperwork was in place. However, mm -hmm. the truck was overloaded um, and an additional vehicle was then called in um, to take over some of the bodies because the paperwork was in place and the driver was then allowed to continue with his trip. So there's no criminal investigation underway. But, uh, I need to understand this. So it, it, there's usually a, a dead body, like it's dealt with within a couple of days, right? There's a funeral and then it's gone. Like what, what, do, what do we need to be transporting 106 people cross country for? What's that all about? Did there, was there an explanation? No. Um, yeah. Basically, the, the investigation continues. God, so we incredible. don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's Jeez. just crazy. Can you imagine uh, being the traffic cop who's just like doing a routine stop and he yeah. opens up oh. and finds, oi. Carl says, you wouldn't catch me dead on that truck. <laughs> Come on. Just by, by the way, the, the, um, the foundation I was thinking of is called the Early Care Foundation. The Early Care Foundation. And actually, I'll give you the website details because they are looking for people to help. Um, because these kids need meals and they, they, we need to keep these creches open for them. And we'll tell you more about that in the interview. But it's called the Early Care Foundation. So just to go back and correct something there. All right, so a bunch of buddies on a truck. And uh, somebody says here, Corona's Boring says, is it because of our obesity rates? Is that why the truck was overloaded? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because usually you can have 106 bodies, but these bodies were overweight. Was it refrigerated is a good question from Bev. That's what I wanted to know. Because surely, if, it's just, surely. If, it's a hot, if it's just a hot truck, you know, like a normal, I don't know if anyone wants to be near that well, truck. I mean, being an avid um, crime series watcher, uh, the, the body can disintegrate all the way through a ceiling into the next floor below. Oh my God. Um, if you're in like a multi-level um, household or, or apartment block, the body yep. can disintegrate completely. Everything except the bones can fall Shit. through building material and see oh it in, in a liquid, in, oh. in a liquid form into the next. So that the truck would have to have been because not even a pine box will stop that. Had to have been refrigerated, surely. It's always amazing, like the, you know that the morgues. This is a very depressing uh very dark conversation but you know the morgues they, they there are unclaimed bodies there every year there are people who just they die they get picked up on the street nobody knows who they are who they belong to no one ever claims them and the morgues just have to get rid of these uh these unclaimed bodies mm. i suppose they put them in a mass grave or you know municipal cemetery somewhere that's pretty pretty wild that like you could die and no one would know who you were or bother to claim your body right no, absolutely. Yeah. I think in this case, they must have known who the bodies were because they were transporting them to a specific place. Um, and it was yeah. an undertaker who was moving the bodies. So it must have been yeah. people who want, who perhaps died in one place and needed to be transported to another. And I mean, in that case, it tells me that you're going to have to wait a, a little while, a few days or more, to collect enough bodies to, to make that trip. Sure. Alternatively... They could have been taking the bodies to a necrophiliac au auction, you know. Well, you've got oh, to be open. You got to be open to it. You got to be open. wrong with you. That's horrendous. Uh, Doctor Robin says saying. the explanation is that the that the, what they could have had is a crematorium that couldn't cope with the numbers. Oy, oy, oy. Mm. Yeah. But why um, don't we just donate these bodies to science? I mean, what what are we doing? You know, yeah, like but, I know universities are struggling to get bodies to slice up. Well, why aren't we doing that? Well. You know, um, I heard the most interesting thing in a documentary I watched this weekend about uh, Alexandria in ancient Egypt. There's a doctor called Galen, uh, G-A-L-E-N, I think. And he, 
he was the first person to figure out that the brain was where we it's the it's the main control and command mechanism i mean this sounds obvious now but we're talking about you know the year kind of 100 bc or something where people actually thought that i mean the ancient greek philosophers used to think that the brain was just a ventilation system for the heart so <laughs> things really developed because this galen was able to do you know in the early years of, of christianity anyway um you couldn't really do anything to a body because it, there were there were religious connotations to that but the ancient egyptians had always always mummified people and therefore they were quite used to dealing with the body as an object and not as some kind of revered vessel for the soul and he had to go to alexandria this doctor and experiment on the brain and on the nervous system to figure out a whole lot of this stuff because egypt was the only place that allowed him to do that and when you talk about donating bodies to science there's still a lot of people who are absolutely dead against that and there's some people who are like yeah take take me and my organs and let some medical students learn that's the way to do things that's what i, I wonder how have you done it? So you you're actually a like an organ donor, and you are available for medical. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Plus, at the Body Show, what's the name? Old, uh, I forget what his name. Guns or whatever. I forget what that guy's name is. I don't know. If, did you ever go to the Body Show when you came here to South Africa? No, I, I really wanted to get to it. No. Oh, where well, yeah. he has done um, slivers, so microscopic yeah. slivers of of an entire corpse. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. He's also got put them onto slides. No, no, well, oh, yes. just got like full bodies just you can come and touch it over here incredible Amazing. thing I, I went and signed up with him as well if you want my body grab it oh really so, so he oh, can yeah. he so you actually want the artist in case here to to take your body and and put you on full display and and have me as a bit of a muse yes if that's where you were headed absolutely <laughs> yes ah that's incredible all right uh how do how do you how can you tell if someone's from a certain country you can tell from their accent you could tell from the way they dress. You can tell from maybe the whole different language. Um, you can you could tell because they might have a, a, an identifying pin of their flag or something on their jacket. You, you, there are a number of ways you can tell where someone's from, right? But usually you just have to ask them. Now, apparently, finger counting, as, as in counting with your fingers, one, two, three, four, five, that is a, a giveaway of your nationality. Mm -hmm. Very true. Um, I mean, you, if you if I had to ask you now to show me what three is on your fingers, what would you do? Yeah, I'd say probably like that three. So Gareth, you've got your three middle fingers up. Yeah. And you you're you're facing them to someone. M Bolelo. Open palm, three fingers. Yeah. Bolelo. Will... Bolelo. So you and do... Bolelo, you 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 you, uh, Pinky, you open your finger, middle finger. Right. And you use the other side of your hand the top of your hand rather than the palm. Yeah. Also, yeah. where do you start counting if you're going to count to five on your fingers? Thumb. Pinky for Mbulelo. Pinky for thumb, me. Thumb for me. So looking okay. at what people do um, around the world, if you're in the UK or many parts of Europe, you probably mm -hmm. start counting with your thumb and you finish with the okay. pinky. While right. in the US they start counting with the index finger what ending with the thumb so they start with one being your index finger right two like a peace sign three like a, a, a an alien sign four is with your pinky up everything except your thumb and five they end up with your foot so they your, save your the thumb, thumb to up. last and it's not even yes. in sequence that doesn't make any sense yeah start with a uh, thumb one, two, three, four, five. As five as your pinky. Done. Surely that's... In, Japan, in uh, parts of the Middle East, like Iran, they mm -hmm. begin with the pinky. And okay. in Japan, they actually start with their fingers extended in an open palm. So all five fingers are out. And they draw them in one by one to make a close... That makes first. the most sense. That one <laughs> makes the most sense. That's why Japan wins. That one actually is the way to do it. Oh, how does it make more sense? You, well, you're left no, no, with zero at the end of everything. No, no, because even if you're stupid, right? If, if you're waiting for me to, oh, I can't see it's two or three. I'm starting with five. It's very clear to uh -huh. you, right? Yeah. Four, three, no, like any dumb-dumb, that one works. That's, I'm going to start doing that. 
I think that's bullshit because you're always left with zero. It doesn't help you to count. What's wrong with you? Yes, you but, but I'm saying, how many how many pricks have you seen going one, two, three? Oh, flip, I'm out of fingers. Uh, what, was it six or seven? Like, no. Stupid. You, you keep going. You use an, another hand. You're like five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, so on. But also, you, you're not using your hands to do big calculations. You're using them usually to do small ones. But also, there's two different things here. The one is counting, and the other is showing someone certain numbers if they can't hear you, right? Okay. But I still um, don't get the Japanese system doesn't make any sense to me. Bulelo thinks he's stumbled upon some kind of genius here. <laughs> What's interesting now is India. They uh -huh. actually use the, the lines between the segments of the fingers to count. Oh, you're kidding. Now, that's interesting. So this means that each digit can represent four numbers. And the whole hand can represent 20. Hmm. Wow. I tried to figure this out, and I, I, I'm battling with it. Jeez. I'm, they use the I, lines I, between the segments of the fingers to count. Yeah. This means so each I'm, digit can be like 4, 8, 12, 16, 20. No, I don't see 4. I see 3. So on, on, I don't know how your fingers work, you lizard woman. But here, I've got... <laughs> You got the, the very top of your finger, and then your first bend is one, right? The second bend is two, and the third bend where it joins the hand is three. So three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen is what I've got. I don't understand oh, how you oh. get to twenty. That's amazing. Uh, and we, we can't we, we can't argue with India. Their academic standards, particularly for maths and science, are so much better than Africa. We maybe can't dictate to them. So speaking of speaking of Africa, in parts of Eastern Africa like Tanzania. Um, mm -hmm. there people use both hands in a symmetric way as much as possible. So, for instance, the number six, for example, is yes. shown with those those middle three fingers, right? Um, as as you're showing three, and the other hand. So they so try and bring and symmetry three. to it. Yeah, three and three on each hand. Okay, that's okay. right. Then uh, there's the indigenous right. northern uh, people of Mexico who count on their knuckles. Oh, wow. And then there is the now extinct Yuki language in California, which actually used the spaces between the fingers. So that would be four on one hand and four on the other. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's just interesting how we have 10 digits, and, and that's probably how we started counting in tens and how numbering came about. Yeah, that's why imagine, 10 is... Imagine we had 12 fingers, you know. Yeah, then then we we twelve would be the system that we would use, because yeah. often people will people will just round something down to the nearest five or ten, just because we've got five fingers in each hand. But of course, there are questions. Then uh, Inga says, "What happens if you lose a finger?" Well, you, well, you, well, you, Inga finger. <laughs> no, then then you can't count. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, listen, it's time for collectomania. I'm very excited to have Gwendolyn on the show this morning. So we've talked to some people who have some pretty wild and wacky collections, right? And Collectomania is your chance to share your own collection with us. We want you to email us if you've got a collection, like Gwendolyn did. And you can send it to contact at cliffcentral.com. That's C-O-N-T-A-C-T. -T. And um, that's what Gwendolyn did. She emailed us. She said, I collect G1, which is Generation 1, My Little Pony Toys from the 1980s. Mm. I've got about 150, and secretly a few of them are my favorites. Um, I only started collecting again recently and went from 0 to 150 in just under a year. It is fascinating, and the ponies are so cute. I have my many complete sets, and some sets are close to completion. I'm obsessed with them and join auctions two to three times a week. I love the ponies so much, and they are so nostalgic for me. There's absolutely nothing negative about my little pony. They're just pure innocence and joy. So that's fascinating. And we're going to talk to Gwendolyn in a second. But I don't, I have to remind myself of what my little ponies were. Oh, and then when no. I so, them, such a fresh memory for me. Really? Tell us about your memory of them. Um, yeah. So I was definitely prime target of when my little pony started. And yeah. uh, in fact, we, we didn't even, it, it, it started with the collection for us, with the actual figurines. Um, and again, it was like a thing with Barbies. You know, the richer your friend was, the more My Little Ponies they had, or the wealth was measured the other way around. 
And right. if they had the latest one, they had the most money. Um, but just remembering the different types, the different colors. I remember I had a cherry blossom one. Um, and the cherry blossom one, they, their asses actually smell like cherry blossom. <laughs> um, I had a, an apple one. And his hind legs also smelled like like apple. And they come with their own brushes and bows and glitter bits and twisters, twisting machines to twist their hair and plait their manes. Oh, it's just unbelievable. So nostalgic. So nostalgic. I, the, only, the only thing, so I, I Googled My Little Pony and, and I remembered that my sister had a couple of them and she was also obsessed with them when she was little. So mm. I'm really excited to speak to Gwendolyn. Let's go straight to her right now and see what she can tell us about the My Little Pony collection. Hey, Gwendolyn, how are you? Hey, good. Nice to good see to you. Be here. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> this is a very strange thing to collect. Um, you you got to admit, I don't think that there are too many people who either have a collection like this or are willing to admit that they have a collection like this. <laughs> how long have you been doing this? You said you got them all, 150 of them in one year. Yeah, so October last year I started again, but um, to be fair, I did I did start collecting them as a child, so it does you know stem back from my childhood. Uh, that's definitely where the obsession came from. And then I'm Zimbabwean, so I think you can put two and two together. I no longer had my collection um, right. by the time I left Zimbabwe, and um, I, and then I guess with lockdown, I don't, it just sort of popped into my head. You know, oh my gosh, remember My Little Pony. And, um, and yeah, I mean, the obsession just came so quickly and right. really unexpectedly, I started off with just a few and, and now I have hundreds <laughs> in a very short time. So that's amazing. But do you think that this comes from your childhood in some sense that you, you didn't get all the ponies you wanted as a kid? And now that you're an adult <laughs> and you can get them, you're like, I'm going to get them all. <laughs> um, I, I don't think it's, it's about a acquisition or trying to acquire something i mean i do joke that it's you know i'm trying to buy back my childhood but yeah. i think maybe don't tell my parents i said that <laughs> um <laughs> um but yeah and you know it's it's definitely not like a maximizing objective you know i need to get this many and i need to get this one but um it's just super addictive as well the, the actual process of finding them and collecting them because there there are these facebook live auctions um, which are super fun. And then you're like, oh, I don't have that one. And it's going for super cheap. And then you bid on it. And then, you know, the next thing someone's bidding against you and it becomes kind of pride that you have to continue the, bidding to get the pony. Uh, uh, there's so many things I've got to ask you here, but let's just start off. You, <laughs> you don't have any of your original ones that you had as a little girl. So you've had to yeah. start from... Sorry. <laughs> So you, you've had to start from scratch. So how do you even begin? I mean, was this just a, like, ah, let me just do this for fun. Yeah, you know, I've got some money lying around. Let me just buy one or two My Little Ponies at an auction. How does it go from that to, ooh, I've now got 150 of them in the cupboard? Um, I mean, I guess that's the crux of your show, right? Like, how does it go from that to 150? I, I, I don't know that necessarily I can answer that. Um, but I... I mean, for me, yes, it started off as let me replace the ones that I remember having as a child. Um, so definitely I'm more nostalgic. So like this is Yum Yum. She's my favorite. And I had her as a child and she was definitely my favorite childhood pony. Um, so it was, you know, it sort of started of let me just get the ones that I had as a kid. But originally when I you know I didn't think I was obviously going to just find those ones so and I didn't know there was a whole community so I just put an ad one on I love Melville one on I love Parkhurst and I said look I'm looking at that time I didn't even know they were called G1s I'm looking for the original 1980s toys and just a couple of random people you know one from Parkhurst one from Melville replied and said oh I've got some of those lying around you know you're welcome to come and get them um, and then through that um, there is a little community in South Africa of collectors. Uh, we have a WhatsApp group. We actually have a Facebook page as well. Um, and they invited me to the Facebook page. And then through the South African Facebook page, I found the global Facebook page, which is where all the, the, the auctions and the wow. fun really happens. All right. So, oh, this is amazing. Okay. First of all, 150 of these things. You, you said Yum Yum over there is one of your favorites. But who else have you got that you want to show us? 
Um, so I've got Bluebell, who is also a childhood pony. Um, so her I bought from eBay. So when um, when I get serious, then I go on to eBay. And often um, they will have buy now options instead of having to bid. Um, because right. sniping, sniping is a real thing on eBay. Um, you know, you think people would be like super sweet, my little pony people, but you know, actually there can be some real <laughs> dodgy <laughs> eBay snipers out there who just leave a come in at the last second. These evil my little pony people. <laughs> my little pony people. <laughs> these these my little pony dicks who are trying to steal other people's money. Stab yeah. you in the back, you know. Yeah, the, the snipers don't have a good reputation. Right, um, um, Applejack's I, a favorite, so I, you oh, might yeah, Apple maybe Jack. remember Applejack. Yeah, that's yeah. the one I had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, 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 oh. and what's this all about? These hands going like that. What is that it's all a, about? It's a pony dumb pony. <laughs> So also Applejack was on the TV show. So I think yes. you know a lot of kids remember Applejack from the TV show as well. All right. So take us through Applejack. here's a picture. I put this up now. So who are these? So uh the orange one is Seabreeze and the yellow one is Dancing Butterflies. Um so these these are special because these are the first two ponies that I bought from overseas. At you know, at least this time. I, I don't know necessarily that I had any from overseas when I was a kid. Um, but in this, you know, this frenzy of collecting, um, Seabreeze and Dancing Butterflies. So they're both Pegasus ponies. So you get different um, shapes of pony. So the Pegasus the are wings. the wings, exactly. And then you get the unicorns and then you get the earth ponies, um, which are just don't have wings or unicorns. <laughs> um, and then you, you yeah. <laughs> Earth pony. That's those. Okay. They, they, they know, they're no special features. They're just ordinary. Little, <laughs> well, right. all ponies are special, right? <laughs> yeah. What's going on in this picture? Who are all of these? Oh, the hats. So these are the big brother ponies. Um, there were some of them again in the show. Um, so that yeah, the the hats are really cool to collect. So the the pink one. Unfortunately, I have bought the hat, but what I do is I I don't. Um, I don't send them all in one go because it just becomes a bit much. So I build boxes. So I do have Slugger, the pink one. I do have his hat, but it's sitting in a box in Canada. I paid more for the hat than I paid for the pony, by the way. Wow. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I have all the big brothers um, with their hats. So I do have Slugger's hat technically, and then I'm just waiting on Chief's hat. And then I have all of the big brother ponies with their hats. And I think there's maybe only one other person in South Africa who... Jeez. You can claim that. <laughs> Very. That's impressive stuff. You know, you know, you've got this piece that you have to get. It. So, what's going on in this? This is the big collection, right? That's the whole lot. And your cat yes. playing in the background, which is so gorgeous. <laughs> Someone cats asked my, you how many cats? <laughs> uh, cat, cats and My Little Pony is actually a thing. So there, there's even again another Facebook page of Cats and My Little Pony. So people, I guess, I, I guess people who collect My Little Pony has also an opinion. I cats. think I found my people, Gareth. <laughs> well, we've been looking. We've been looking for the <laughs> weird crowd for you. This sounds like your kind of crowd. This is good. Yeah. So, so th Jeez. that um, right. well, that I cabinet. Mean, th th um, this I this must be expensive. Yeah, go on. The cabinet. I, I was saying that cabinet. Yeah, that that's now all the ponies have been relocated because they were looking to me a bit like. Uh, they were in Filipino jail or something in there, so I decided to to bring them all out, and I, I swapped the books. The books are now double layered and to squashed into the cabinet, and the, the ponies are on the on the huge bookshelf. So yeah, they're really expanding. I actually spoke to someone on Friday about um, custom building me shelves uh, because I'm just running out of space to put them. <laughs> Fantastic! What is all of this? Sorry, Leanne. Uh, what is what is an average one? Because I mean, they couldn't have been expensive back in the nineteen nineties or whatever when they were made. The eighties, yeah. So, 80s. um, in the eighties, no, they they weren't exactly. So they were, you know, just sort of whatever a toy would cost in, at that time. Um, but they can range anywhere from five dollars to. Uh, there's currently a South African um, Sky Dancer prototype on eBay for 
a thousand five hundred pounds. What? Uh, yeah, that's for one pony. So there really is a huge, um, a huge price range. So in terms of my collection, um, the most I paid for a pony is about three and a half thousand rand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I have also had some some great deals as well. So um, I do value them differently to what I pay for them based on you know my knowledge from the auctions and eBay prices, etc. So you, you do get some good deals, but but some I do definitely splurge splurge on. <laughs> wow. Leanne, you wanted to ask. Oh me. yes. Do do the ones with scents still carry their scent? Uh, so some of them do. So I have a Coco Berry who is one of the Sunday best ponies. So I don't know if you remember they, their cutie mark, um, the, this is called a cutie mm -hmm. mark. So it, it comes off their body a little bit. So they had like little ice cream sundaes, um, different little desserts. Um, and those ponies came with scent. Um, so my cocoa berry smells incredible. And if you smell her, it's just, you know, smell is the strongest um, mm. nostalgia sense. And it, it just takes you back. Um, as I said, you know, just trying to recapture something of my childhood, I guess. And it just, it's yeah. amazing to smell her. So yes, I do, I do have one or two that have retained their scent. Um, but most of them, I mean, it's, you know, it's now 35, 40 years since yeah. you know, that, that the ponies have been around. So understandably, a lot of them have lost their, their smell. So and here's a it, question. Sorry, I, go I, ahead. I just have one question. Is, do, are there communities where, like, you know, in the States and Britain and whatever, I've seen where uh, communities gather, swap, trade, there's an event every three months. Is there, like, I mean, for me, I, now that you guys are talking about it, I do kind of remember my little pony. Is, is there a community in South Africa where you meet up every four months? Hey, I got this, you got this, let's swap it out, or, or not really yet? So, I mean, for for me, not necessarily, because I, I've only been collecting since October and there's been a pandemic. So we, I guess we haven't really been getting together. But I have met um, a couple of the South African collectors. There's one who lives really close to me. And we actually connected because we get our ponies delivered to the same postnet. And we mm. recognized each other's names on the signing <laughs> list. <laughs> so we you. became... Get you. <laughs> so she, she might steal your parcel and try to palm them off as her own. <laughs> no, as I, as I said, apart from the snipers, pony people are good people. <laughs> I, want to, uh, I want you to ID this pony for us quickly. Um, oh, no. <laughs> okay. okay. So Tracy says, I remember my first My Little Pony was Parasol. She was purple with pink hair and had those little umbrellas on her bum. Do you know Parasol? <laughs> I do know Parasol. Parasol's lovely. So she's also in the, sh the shy pose, the same pose as Applejack. She's an earth pony. So she looks like Applejack, except she's pink and she has um, little uh, little umbrellas as her cutie mark. She's lovely. And she, she's a rainbow pony, so she, she has rainbow-colored hair as well um, instead of just the plain yellow. So, yeah, she's, she's a lovely pony. I love Parasol. And I have well, a really uh, nice one. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm not surprised. Uh, Tracy uh, says, "Flip this takes takes me back. Gummy bears, cabbage patch kids, and Thundercats, etc. Yeah, all of that stuff from around about that time. That's amazing." And Rebellious yeah. Ruth says, "I love this. Thanks for sharing. It's so nostalgic." <laughs> it's awesome, and and I people really do love it. You know, so every time I I do have someone come to my house, the first thing I do is take them to the collection and. And everyone has to pick a pony, um, and that pony kind of has to be their buddy the, the whole time that they are at my house. <laughs> you pick one that you feel the most affinity to, and then the pony mm -hmm. kind of follows you around. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I kind of like that. I, I really, really like that because one of my favorite sayings is there is no free lunch, and at your house there literally isn't. You've got to have a buddy who you've got to look after. I love that. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Do some people think you're a bit of a, a lunatic in that case? Are some people frightened by this when they see that you've got this interesting new collection and uh, you know it's something that you're quite uh, interested in and obsessed with maybe a little bit? Um, do, does it frighten people off? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I know I, I did go on a few dates <laughs> this year, which <laughs> kind of, you know, there were no second dates. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> 
This is what I'm. This is what I'm worried about. No, uh, <laughs> no, no, but I, I, uh, no, no, not really. I, I, I have, I have since found somebody who who thinks it's awesome. So that's all that really matters to me. You know, I'm one of those people. Of, if 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 it's not your cup of tea, fantastic. You do you. Right. You know. Yeah. I like so, that, but I, I would be particularly concerned if there was a man who was collecting my little ponies. Have you met any men who are part of this community? There is. So um, one of the biggest collectors in South Africa is in Cape Town, and he's uh, he's a guy. So we honorary call them bronies. I don't know if you've come across no. that term. <laughs> so, so there are bronies. Um, th there's actually there's a whole documentary on bronies, but they are uh, fans of the G4s. Um, so the friendship is magic, you know, Twilight Sparkle, Rainbow Dash, which are not the original um, G ones. Uh, and then, so so going back to Mbelelo's question, there is like a whole PonyCon um, conventions that happen in the states in the UK, and the Bronies actually have their own convention, and they grown men that you know whatever sexuality, you know, you might think there might be a stereotypical sexuality attached to that but it's really not and they will dress as my little ponies and go and listen to people speaking and collect and swap toys and it's amazing it's really for anybody and it's it, it really is as i said you know about childhood and joy and it doesn't matter who you are or you know what your gender or anything it doesn't it doesn't matter it's just for everyone who loves something are there bad ponies? This is a serious question here from Captain Black Knees. Uh, it says, are there bad ponies in Ponyland, like antagonists or the black pony? You know, like dangerous, so, nasty, nasty. In, in the G4, in the Friendship is Magic, um, I haven't really watched that, but I do know there is a bad pony. And, <laughs> yeah, she's she's all shadowy. and um, But in the, the G1s, um, which we remember, uh, Leanne, as – you know, in the in the TV show in Ponyland, there were no bad ponies. So the all the the baddies were humans, actually. Um, so Hedia and her two daughters that lived on the mountain, and sent the schmooze, which was just some kind of um, I don't know gloop that went across the land. And then the flatter ponies had to come and uh, you know flatter their wings to get rid of the schmooze so no they in the g1 in g1 world there are no bad ponies in g4 okay. world there is yeah so that that you know and we tend to be quite loyalist like the g1s are quite strictly the g1s and the g4s are quite strictly the g4s well you've blown our minds i mean i, I actually don't even know where to go from here but thank you I, and thank you for sharing your collection with us i think it's amazing that there are people who are collecting even toys from the 1980s like yours. And uh, I'm sure that your collection is a source of great pride to you. I hope you end up collecting all the ones you want and, uh, and, and you know, put them on a display. Have a special cabinet made. What the hell? Not, why not? Exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm so happy to share them. I absolutely adore them. <laughs> Thank you. And we just love that, you, that you, you love these things so much. It makes me so happy to see people who are passionate about something. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers! Isn't that cool? Very well, nice. there's another, there's another wacky collection that I mean, I'm just, yeah, you know, do your thing, do your thing. There, bronies, so I just, can't, I can't believe us. they're a brony. Yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, gobsmacked. I'm gobsmacked. But I love that. There's so much room for all of us to do our thing. That's so cool. I'm so surprised by you, Mbulelo, when it comes to these collections. Because I, I I pin you for a minimalist who only has things that serve a purpose. Um, yes, so you're right. I'm I'm it it takes me by surprise. It's a pleasant surprise. No, yeah. you, you know, yeah. I mean, my, like a a big thing for me, my old duck. She always says, "Let people be," and I'm terrible at that. And I love to. I, I want to grow as well. I, I'm happy that people have their thing, man. People must have their thing. I have my and thing. That's and so you know cool. what? The more the more kind of eccentric and 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 strange you are, the more curious you are, the more eccentric you are. I think the more you find a person that is tailored to your needs later on, because that person has to accept all of those things from the get go, right? And they they kind of they're probably willing to compromise in in other ways too. And and you probably will as well, because you realize like I've got this 
collection that kind of dominates a lot of my time and uses up a lot of my energy and my resources. And if you don't like that, then you don't like me. You know? Yeah. I think it's I think it's great. So Robin says, my cousin collects pigs. She's been married four times. <laughs> <laughs> she sounds like my hero. Uh, that house chair I'm looking for, you're welcome. <laughs> Do you have any of your old toys from when you were a kid? I've kept, um, I've got a tiny jewelry box and I've kept a couple of things in there, but. No, um, I, I, the other thing I do have, and I'm looking at them right now, are my storyteller books and storyteller tapes, cassettes, which I obviously don't play. But um, I know every inflection and intonation in the entire 20 volume series of about 40 stories oh. each. So I don't really need the tapes, it's all stuck in my head. But that's and probably my, my favorite that's collection. So interesting. That's so interesting to me again, Leanne, is because I've never been into like Disney or cartoons ever, right? Like ever, 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 even when I was young. So it is interesting to me when people have these kind of uh, throwbacks and they, 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 you know, sort of rekindle their, their childhood. It's like, that's, that's so cool. Cause that's the best time so between six and what I'd say is the best time in life, right? Reckless abandon, zero consequences. And we just full sin. Any, any time's the best time, as long as you're having fun. Um, Bolello, would you rather, there's a question from Tracy. Sure. Tracy says, would you rather go for lunch at Gwen and buddy up with a pony or go for a Butts Bry at his Lapa rock pool? Oh shit. That is a good question. That's a good one. That is a, that, oh, bloody hell. A Lapa. So there's obviously an agra- above ground uh, jacuzzi there. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, uh, no, probably Gwen's house. No, because <laughs> Gwen cares about something. Yeah, probably Gwen's. Yeah, the the, the, the Lapa Oak doesn't care about this. Gwen, Gwen's a dime a dozen. Yeah, no, I'm with Gwen. Uh, yeah, I'm at Gwen's house. Uh, yeah, imaginary pony or whatever the ponies are called. Yeah, uh, yeah. You'd have, that's you'd what have I'm to doing. choose what fragrant uh, parasol garden or whatever, yeah. and then she would sit on the table with you. Well, Could, and you and Gwen would talk to your ponies while you talk to each other. Imagine well, that. Gwen has standards. Gwen has standards. So the the the, the oak with the above ground um, jacuzzi and larpa has absolutely no standards. No, thank you. <laughs> Somebody says question. get <laughs> get a sangoma on next. They collect bones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see, if we can do that. Um, so also, Tracy says she's got her Kermit soft toy. I from- I used to. Yeah, I used to buy my sister because obviously she was once little. I used to buy her soft toys everywhere I went. I'd buy her a little soft toy. And eventually the collection got so big that um, she just said to me, look, uh, first of all, I'm too old now to be getting soft toys. So I stopped. But she also said, I've got nowhere to put them anymore. And uh, so we, we put them all in, in black rubbish bags and sent them off to a, an orphanage or something. I hope that they got used and not just set on fire. You never know. Orphans. I'm sure they break won't things. be used. No, you know what orphans are like. They always break things. <laughs> oh, my God, Gareth. Oh my, God. Uh, um, my ex-husband, Michelle says, collects kinder egg toys. He had over a thousand. Yo. Yo, yo, yo. Those are cool. You have to build some a, of them, That's right? a little bit of cool. too. Build some, right? I think so, sure. yeah. You know those sure. uh, those Kinder eggs, you know, the ones that have got a chocolate and the, and the little toys in them as well. Michael says, "Pony up, Mbulelo. <laughs> and Bev says, "You're never too old for plushies for soft toys." Well, I don't know. Eventually, you get to a point where there's nowhere to put them. And plus, you know, if if they've been on a shelf or something for more than five or six years, they start getting a bit tacky. You know, mm-hmm. you know. How do you clean those things? I don't know how you clean them. Can we have Jacob Zuma on next? He collects wives. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> he does, actually. It would be an interesting guy. Well, well, the first wife, Makumalo, <clears throat> I got her at an auction. And uh... <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> Here's my second wife and third and fourth. <clears throat> anyway, this is the OG. He... The, the, the OG, yeah. <laughs> My 64-year-old dad still loves Lego. Oh, yeah. But Lego I don't think Lego. there's an age limit to, to no. Lego. 
I love Lego. Oh, God. I don't have any Lego in my house at all. But my little nephews, whenever I go over there, I see them playing with Lego. And I'm like, damn, I love that. That's well, we've something seen your brother's collection. Yeah, yeah correct. That's huge. Um, so lots of, uh, of other comments coming up about uh, Gwendolyn and her collection. I just think it's cool. You know, also, like, there's something a little bit geeky and silly about any collection, right? But if you're collecting My Little Ponies and you're proud of it, then I'm like, power to you. Because you don't really care what people think. You're like, I'm going to collect the things I want. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, Bad yeah. Pony, apparently, is a game collectors play after a cosplay convention. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll bet. Okay. Bad Pony. Francois says, I still have my first edition Lion-O from the Thundercats with glowing eyes, and it still works. Maybe I should see what he would go for now and pay off my house. <laughs> you'd be surprised. Hey, you'd be surprised. Like Some of these things are so rare. Um, that and, and there's so much in demand that if you put it on eBay, you'd get huge prices for it. It would go, you know, sometimes if it's in good condition, through the roof, you could pretty much finance a car. Um, on the Lego box, the age limits always stop at 99, i.e. they go from 6 to 99. That's so cool. Yeah, that mm-hmm. is. I never even noticed that, but that I think that's yeah, true. Yeah, because after 99, you might start swallowing, thinking that they're like pieces of cookie. Or one of your pills. Yeah, like, uh, and I have, to, I have to take this handful of pills every day, so I have my uh, Lego Crunch. and start crunching the Lego. Anyway, no Lego right. for Philip. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Uh, that's all we got time for this morning. But we will see you tomorrow, bright and early at six o'clock. Have an excellent day, and uh, catch us on the flip side tomorrow morning at six. A.